Chapter 4, A Cruel Place During the next few days, it seemed like a moment did not pass without Miss Scatcherd scolding Helen. Burns, you're sticking your chin out, she'd say to her. Burns, hold your head up. One time, she asked the class a question. None of the girls knew the answer, except for Helen. But when she raised her hand, Miss Scatcherd said, You dirty girl, you didn't clean your nails this morning. Helen was silent. Why doesn't she explain that the water in the basin was frozen over with ice, I thought. None of us had been able to wash up. You're a slob, Miss Scatcherd said. When will you learn to be neat? That evening, I saw Helen standing by the fireplace in the recreation room. She had the same faraway look in her eyes I had observed the first day. It was as if she lived in a dream and nothing could touch her. You must wish you could leave school, I said. Why would I, she said. I came here to get an education, and I'll stay till I get one. But Miss Scatcherd treats you so badly. Badly? Not at all. She's trying to correct my faults. But you don't have any faults. You're good. I do have faults, Helen said. I'm messy. Miss Scatcherd was right to call me a slob. I'm disobedient. I'm absent-minded. I don't understand how you can be so calm about it. If it were me, I'd hate her from the bottom of my soul. You cannot fight hate with hate. Only love can overcome hatred. It's in the Bible. Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hurt you. According to you, I should love Mrs. Reed, then. I should love her son, John. Well, I can't. I won't. Who are they? I told Helen my story. No doubt Mrs. Reed and her son have been unkind to you, she said. You have to try to forgive them and forget the hurt. Otherwise, the resentment will poison your heart, and you'll be unhappy your whole life. After this talk, Helen and I became close friends. Life at school was hard. All day, every day, we spent our time either in class or studying. Sundays, we had to get up at dawn, walk to church, two miles in the bitter cold, and attend the morning service. We were served a small snack that was supposed to do for both breakfast and lunch. Then we stayed on for the afternoon service and afterward walked back to school. By then, we were weak from hunger and exhaustion. The walk back was uphill and we had to push against the wind that blew down from the snowy mountain ridge. The skin on my face became so raw from the cold that it bled sometimes. As a special treat, we were given a whole slice of bread instead of the usual half slice at tea time. Then we had to spend the whole evening reading the Bible and listening to a long sermon, which was read to us by one of the teachers. By the time we were ordered to march to the dining hall for supper, we could barely stand on our feet or keep our eyes open. And that, dear reader, was our day of rest, the one day we did not have to study. One afternoon, when I had been in school for about three weeks, Miss Temple walked into the classroom, followed by a tall, thin man dressed in black. Before I could see his face, my blood ran cold. I just knew it was Mr. Brocklehurst. I had never seen another man so much like a stone pillar. Miss Temple, he said, I've just gone over the accounts. I see that there has been an extra charge for bread and cheese served as a snack. Please let me explain, Miss Temple said. One morning, the porridge was so badly burned it was inedible. I asked the cook to prepare a snack, or the girls would have to go without food all day. This is a school, Miss Temple. The aim of the school's education is not to pamper the students, but to teach them how to withstand hardship. They should have eaten their burned porridge. You have no authority to make a substitution of bread and cheese. He looked at each girl, inspecting their appearance. Miss Temple, he said in an angry voice. Who is the girl with the red curly hair? It's Julia Severn, Miss Temple replied quietly. Why does she have curls? It's not allowed. Her hair curls naturally, Miss Temple said. Naturally? What sort of an excuse is that? One could say then, in one's defense, that one is naturally a glutton, naturally lazy, naturally a moron. Her hair must be cut off. I'll send in a barber tomorrow. He continued expect inspecting the girls. Finally, my turn came. Ah, the new pupil, he said. What is your name? Jane Eyre, sir. He asked me to bring a stool put it in the middle of the room, and stand on it. I did as he asked. Miss Temple, teachers and children, he said. Do you all see this girl? Of course they did. They were staring right at me. You must be on your guard against this girl. 
This girl is a liar. I learned this from the lady who had adopted her. A respectable, kind, generous lady. She was forced to send her away to this school because she did not want her around her own children. My skin was burning with shame. You are to stand on the stool for half an hour, he said to me. No one is allowed to talk to you for the rest of the day. He left the room. The girls went back to their lessons. When the half hour was up, Miss Miller asked me to take my place back at the table where my class sat. I did, but no one raised their eyes to look at me. Then, when the bell rang for recess, they all avoided me. I walked to the far side of the garden, sat on the ground, hugging my knees with my arms, and wept. Shh, I heard a soft voice say. It was Helen. Oh, Helen, everyone believes that I'm a liar. Who is everyone, Helen said. There are 80 girls in this school. The school is not the whole world. The world contains millions and millions of people. What do I care about the millions and millions? All I know is 80 people. Of these 80 people, everyone despises me. You're wrong, Jane. Not one of the girls despises or even dislikes you. They pity you, that's all. They know Mr. Brocklehurst is an unfair man. But let's say they did hate and despise you. What does it matter if your conscience is clear? A clear conscience is all the friend one needs. I can't bear it to have people hate me, I said. I can't bear it to feel alone. I would rather have every single bone of my body broken than be alone. I want people to love me, Helen. I want people to think well of me. Hush, hush. God loves you, Jane. God loves us all. Helen put her arms around me, and I felt better. She did love me. It did not matter, suddenly, that no one else loved me.